Take your Bibles, if you will, and turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3. We're grateful for the presence of each and every one. We hope that you're here to uh, learn more of God's Word. And if you were here this morning, you know, we started a study, a two-lesson study on the grace of God. Part one was this morning. Part two, of course, tonight, finishing up that story. But we're going to talk about the grace of God, an important topic that should occupy our attention Something that should bring us great joy to know that God is gracious toward us. And we begin the reading here in Romans 3 verse 21 when Paul really gets down to the meat of the Roman letter and tells us what he's writing about. He says, but now the righteousness of God apart from law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by His blood through faith, to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed, to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Now there's a lot there. We're not going to dig into every part of that this evening, but the core of the text is found in verses 24 and 25, where he talks about being justified freely by his grace. That's our topic, isn't it? We're talking about the grace of God, and he says we're justified by his grace. The word justified is a term that is synonymous with forgiveness. Uh, technically, it's a legal term. It had to do with the acquittal of all charges. The charges have been dropped, and that's basically what happens when you're forgiven. And so from a personal perspective, we call it forgiveness. From a legal perspective, we call it justification, but it means essentially the same thing. And he says we're justified or forgiven by his grace. And so we know that the grace of God has a, has a hand in that. It is the basis upon which our salvation rests. But then he says through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. Now that's interesting. Because the word through tells us that the grace is manifested by means of or through that redemption that's in Christ Jesus. The grace of God is connected to the cross of Christ. And that's very important for us to grasp. Grace comes through the redemptive death of Jesus. In fact, in the next verse it says, God set forth Jesus as a propitiation by his blood. A propitiation is a sacrifice of atonement. Some translations will actually say that. A sacrifice of atonement. So Jesus being set forth as a sacrifice really was the manifestation of God's grace. What we want to do tonight is conclude our study. Now let me just back up just a little bit and tell you about this morning's lesson. I'm not going to re-preach the whole thing, but just kind of get, us, get it before our minds. We talked about these false concepts of grace this morning. We talked about the Catholic concept of grace, that it's something dispensed by means of the church's priesthood, and we showed that all Christians are priests, and that Jesus is our link to God, not the church. The Protestant concept is that grace is an enabling power. It's that zapping of the Holy Spirit. In fact, they call it irresistible Grace. That's where that phrase comes from uh, when the Calvinist talks about irresistible grace. That's that zapping that enables you to believe and enables you to believe. We pointed out that that was false because we're not totally depraved to start with. They get started on the wrong foot. Getting a little bit closer to our brethren, some people believe that grace is God ignoring our sins or tolerating our sins. And we pointed out that God never does that. He never ignores or tolerates sin. And then some people see grace kind of like a sunscreen. You put it on to protect you while you go indulge. That's what you do with sunscreen. You put it on to protect you while you indulge in the sun. And some people see grace that way. You put it on to protect you while you go indulge in sin. And all of those are erroneous concepts of grace. They are not true. They are not biblical. And if you want some more information about that, if you weren't here this morning, you can go online and you can listen to the first lesson from this morning and you can get more details about that. But moving forward to tonight's lesson, we want to talk about the true biblical concept of grace. And as you know, I like to begin with definitions so that we're all on the same page. And so we want to start with the definition of the word grace. It comes from the Greek word charis, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it's a word that describes God's attitude toward us. It's an attitude word. And God's attitude toward us is gracious. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. It's one thing to say it, but it's another thing to just think about it. It, it really, literally means goodwill. 
It literally means favor. So God has goodwill toward us. God has favor toward us, listen carefully, in spite of our many sins. That's the beautiful thing. That's the amazing thing. That's why we call it amazing grace. Because despite the fact that we're sinful creatures, despite the fact that we've blown it with God, He's still gracious. He, the last thing God wants to do is send us to hell. Believe me when I tell you that. That's the last thing He wants to do. It's the furthest thing from His mind. But know this too, He will do it. If we don't respond to his grace in a positive way, he will do it. But he really does not want to do that. And so that's what we call a gracious attitude or a gracious disposition. That's what grace means. Now, we, a lot of times we define grace. And we don't stop with the word favor. We say unmerited favor. Now, when you consult the lexicons, they don't say that. The Greek lexicons don't say unmerited favor. We say that. But we say that with good reason. There's a good reason why we say unmerited favor because this grace that we're talking about here is not something that you and I deserve and it's not something that you and I can earn. And we touched on that a little bit this morning. If you turn over to Ephesians 2 in verses 8 and 9 and Paul picks up on this theme of grace again. And this was our reading this morning as a matter of fact. He says in verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Grace being God's part, faith being man's part. By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now that gift of God refers back to the word saved. It's salvation that is the gift of God. And so it is the gift of God, in verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. So it's not the idea that you earned this, that you've been so good in your life and you've behaved yourself so well that God says, well, I've got to save that fella. He's just too good. He's too wonderful. He's too amazing. And that's just not true. Because no matter how hard we've tried, we've all sinned and fallen short. In fact, that was in our reading, wasn't it? Romans 1. All have sinned. Romans 1, uh, uh, 3, I said, I'm sorry. Romans 3, 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Now, when we say grace is unmerited, a lot of people run away with that. And they say, well, since it's unmerited, then there's nothing for you to do at all. And we've all had those conversations with our religious neighbors, haven't we? We've all had, they say, well, there's not, you can do nothing to save yourself from sin. That's just simply not true. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. Turn, if you will, now to John chapter 6. And Jesus explicitly tells us there is something for us to do. In John chapter 6, in verse 28, 29, they asked Jesus an important question. They said to him, what shall we do? that we may work the works of God. Look at the question. What shall we do? We do. That's talking about people, mankind. And they said, what shall we do, Jesus, that we may work the work of God? And Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God that you believe. Notice that. You believe. That's something man does. Faith is something man does. That's on man. God's part is grace. Man's part is faith. And Jesus said, this is the work. Faith is a work. Faith is something you do. You're responsible to do that. So when someone says to you there's nothing for you to do or nothing you can, can do, that's just simply not true. There is something for you to do. Believe. There is something for you to do. Trust. That's your obligation. So grace doesn't mean that there's nothing to do. It just simply means we cannot earn it and we do not deserve it. God gives it to us. Now God manifested His grace in three ways. And we sort of touched on it in Bible class this morning. God manifested His grace in terms of God revealing or coming up with the plan, the plan of salvation. God is the planner. We, remember we talked about that in Bible study. God is the planner, Christ is the executor, and the Holy Spirit is the communicator. Well, that works with grace too. You see, God planned, God in His grace, He planned out this great plan of salvation. That's how God's grace was manifested to us. Turn, if you will, to 2 Timothy chapter 2. I said 2, chapter 1, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy chapter 1. And we'll begin the reading with verse 8, just so we have a little bit of context here. And it's kind of a long reading. I'm going to read it, and then I'll go back through it. 2 Timothy 1, verse 8, Paul said, Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings of the gospel for, uh, according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our own works, 
but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. Now there is a lot right there. We're going to walk through some of that stuff because there is a ton of information in these verses. But the reason I started with verse 8 is because he talks about the power of God. Do you see that there at the end of verse 8? The power of God, verse 9, who has saved us. The who there in verse 9 is God. So God has saved us and called us with a holy calling. The word saved is critical here because that's what we're talking about. Salvation, the plan of salvation, saved by grace. And he says God is the one who's done this. He saved us, he rescued us, he delivered us. And he called us. The calling, of course, comes by means of the gospel, but he called us with a holy calling. There's another uh, word there that indicates our responsibility, holiness. Holiness means that we're separate from sin and that we're set aside to the work of God, to the service of God. That's what holiness is. And you and I have been called to a holy calling. God expects something of you. And he expects something of me. If he's going to extend his grace, then you and I have the obligation to live a holy life. That's exactly what he's saying right there. He's called us with a holy calling. Then the little next phrase, not according to our own works. That's the unmerited part. Remember, we were talking about unmerited favor. It's not according to our own works. You can't do enough good things to put God in debt to you. In fact, here's the, here's the, the grim reality. You could stop sinning today. I'm talking about theoretically. I know that in reality, the Bible says we all sin. But you could stop sinning today. And never commit another sin the rest of your life. And you could still be lost. Why? Well, what about yesterday? You see, all have sinned. And good deeds do not remove bad deeds. So it's not according to our works. See, that's our problem. Good deeds don't remove bad deeds, and once the bad deeds come in, we're finished from our perspective. From anything that we can do, the good deeds that we do from here on out do not remove the bad deeds. So we don't deserve this. It's unmerited. So not according to our works. But, same verse, verse 9, according to his own purpose and grace. There's our subject. His grace. And notice how God's purpose and God's grace are linked together there. God's purpose is to save man. And the way he's going to do that is by his grace. That's the favor. So now you've got the unmerited favor. Not by our works, but according to his grace. The unmerited favor of God. There it is, right there in the verse. And so he goes on to say, verse 9 again, That grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Let that sink in for just a second. You know what that really means? God knew we'd mess up. He knew that we'd mess up. Sooner or later, mankind's going to mess up. Sooner or later, mankind's going to... See, God has the ability to know all things. And he could look out into the future. And he knew that sin was going to come into the world. And so before he ever said, let there be light, before he ever made the first thing in this universe... He already had the plan laid out in his mind. That's what that says. Before time began. The grace was given before time began. He already had the plan in his mind. He knew he was going to make this world. He knew he was going to put man on it. He knew he was going to make man in his image. And he knew man was going to blow it. He just knew it. And so he had this contingency plan to save man in Christ. And as soon as sin kicked in, in Genesis 3, God kicked in the plan of salvation and started it in motion. Because he already knew what would happen, you see. And then the next thing, verse 10. But now, see it was given before time began, but now has been revealed. See, we didn't know about it until the days of Paul when it's fully revealed, you see. Now has been revealed, and how it was revealed? By the appearing of our Savior. When Jesus came into the world, that was the appearance of God's grace. That was the manifestation of God's grace, you see. The appearing of Jesus Christ. And that very neatly leads right into my next point. So let's just stop here and analyze what we've got. By His grace, God the Father conceived of a plan. He already knew we would sin, and He had the plan in His mind. He's the great planner. And then along comes Jesus Christ to execute the plan. And in His grace... Christ provided the sacrifice. That's what we need, you see. Sin is our problem. 
And the solution uh, is going to be found in the grace of God. And, you know, let's, go, let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 18. Sin is our problem, as I said a moment ago. And when it comes down to sin entering our life, you and I have one of two options. With respect to our sins, number one, the sins can be forgiven. Or number two, the sins must be punished. There is no option C. There is no option C. The sins will either be forgiven by the good Lord or they will be punished. There is nothing else. That's it. Those are the two options that you have. And this is illustrated very vividly in Matthew the 18th chapter. Uh, and actually he's talking about human forgiveness, but he uses divine forgiveness to illustrate it. In Matthew 18 verse 21, just to see the context here, Peter came to him, came to Jesus, and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And I'm sure Peter thought he was being generous. But Jesus said, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. That's a hyperbole, an exaggeration. And the Lord is basically saying here that forgiveness is a never-ending thing. It's something that is always needed and something that is always going to be happening if you're going to be right with God. And so up to 70 times 7, and then he slides into this little parable. We won't read the whole parable, but I want to get to the key elements here. Verse 23, therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king, that would be God, God the Father, a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. There's your final judgment. That's when God settles up all the accounts that we have. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, that doesn't mean a whole lot to you and I, because when we think about money, we think about dollars and cents. That's the way we look at money. But a talent was a measure of money back in those days, and it was a huge sum of money. As I understand it, 10,000 talents is roughly the equivalent, and different Bibles will say different things. I, I understand that because scholars aren't 100% certain on this, but from my digging into this, the best I can come up with, 10,000 talents is about the equivalent listen carefully, of 200,000 years of pay at minimum wage. Now, a minimum wage in Bible times was a denarius a day. That's what you worked for. That was just enough food to get your, your supplies for the day, your bread for the day, and that's it. That was minimum wage. And so if you made a denarius a day, it would take you 200,000 years to pay off this debt. This guy's in over his head. You can't live that long. Nobody lives that long. Not even Adam and Eve, not even Methuselah lived that long. This guy's in over his head. That's what sin does to us. Sin puts us in over our head. We are in a mess. We are in over our heads. We can't pay this debt. There's no way in the world we can pay this debt. So verse 25 says, As he was not able to pay, his master, that's God, remember, commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment be made. That's punishment. That's justice right there. I'm going to sell you into slavery. And I'm going to sell your wife into slavery. And guess what? You're probably going to go this way, and she's probably going to go that way. And not only am I going to sell you, and I'm going to sell your wife, I'm going to sell your children. And one of your children is going to go that way, and another one's going to go that way, and another one might go that way. So you're all going to be split up. You're going in different directions here. Not only that, but I'm selling everything you've got. Your wagons, your horses, your barns, your house, anything you got, the money you got laid up in a sack under the mattress, it, it's all gone. And he says, payment is going to be made. That's going to go toward the debt. Now, it won't be enough, but that's justice. That's punishment. The servant, therefore, fell down before him and he said, Master, have patience with me and I will pay you all. I'm begging for mercy, begging for grace. I don't want to be begging, for, begging for grace, begging for mercy. And the master of that servant was moved with compassion. Here comes the grace. Moved with compassion, rele uh, released him, and forgave him the debt. And there you see the two options, punishment or forgiveness. There is no option C. That's all there is. That's the only two options. You're going to be punished for your sins or you're going to be forgiven. I don't know about you, but I'd rather take the forgiveness route. Because the real punishment for sin is everlasting fire in, in a place called hell. I don't want that. God doesn't want that for you either. And that's why God is compassionate and God is gracious. But in order to forgive our sins, something was required. The scripture calls it blood. A blood, a substitutionary offering of blood had to be made. The blood substitutes for our punishment. That's exactly what it is. And it's not a one-to-one -one substitution. Blood is a physical thing. 
And my soul is a spiritual thing. And yet the Bible says, I have given blood upon the altar, blood, a physical thing, to make atonement for your souls, a spiritual thing, Leviticus 17, 11. So it's not an even, even substitution, but a substitutionary offering of blood had to be made. Turn your Bibles now over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. The Hebrew writer, his whole theme here is to discuss the differences between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And a great uh, key word in the Hebrew letter is better. Better covenant, better sacrifices. Everything's better under the New Covenant, you see. And so that's a key word, and he contrasts the old and the new and the animal sacrifices versus the sacrifice of Christ. And that brings us to 922. And the writer says, according to the law, talking about the law of Moses, according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. They had all kinds of blood sacrifices, bulls and goats and rams, and, and, and all of these animals, and the priests sacrificing every day up to their elbows in blood and the stench of death everywhere. All things are purified with blood. And here it is, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. That's a decree of God. I didn't make that up. That's just the way it is. God said that's the way it shall be. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. But the blood of animals couldn't do the job. They were just there as a prefigure to sort of show us what was coming. That one was coming, the true Lamb of God, who would take away the sins of the world. In fact, isn't that what John the Baptist said when he first saw Jesus? He said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. There's the true Lamb right there. It's not an animal, but it's the Son of God Himself. And that substitutionary offering, He lays down His life for me. Lays down His life in my stead. Sheds His blood to substitute for my punishment, you see. And that sacrifice enables God to say, I forgive you, and I will let you go. And all of that, listen very carefully, all of that is connected right in with the grace of God. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And we're going to link this whole idea of Christ's death on the cross to the grace of God. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. And here it is. For you know the grace... Of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is. And that's my second point. By His grace Christ. By His grace Christ. So you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. That you through His poverty might become rich. Now that's kind of vague language, but I think we know what He's talking about here. He was rich up there in heaven. Think of that. He never left heaven before. He'd been up there with the Father, been up there in heaven, right next to his Father, creator of the universe, enjoying all the beauties and all the glories and all the blessings of heaven, angels attending to his every wish and every whim. And then one day he becomes poor and he leaves heaven. Now can I suggest to you, by the way, that the sacrifice of Jesus began the moment he left heaven. That was a sacrifice. To give up the riches of heaven. To give up the glory of being right there with the Father and come down here to this earth and put on human flesh. There's another sacrifice. I come down to this earth, number one. I put on human flesh, number two. There's another sacrifice. I face the temptations of the devil. There's another sacrifice. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. He chose to come down here to put on flesh, to face the temptations of the devil. Then the ultimate poverty his death on the cross. You can't get much poor, more poor than that. You've given it all up. You've given up your place in heaven. You've put on human flesh. You've faced temptation and defeated it. And then you die. You can't get much poorer than that. So he became poor so that you and me, through his poverty, through what he did, might become rich. That we might have forgiveness of sins. That we might be able to be with God. And notice how in verse 8 that's connected to the grace of God. That is grace. That's what grace is right there. Jesus on the cross. That is what grace is. Another passage. Hebrews 2. And the writer, he talks about, just, just to put him in context here. We'll start with verse 6. We're going to verse 9, but we'll start with verse 6. He quotes from Psalms 8, verse 6, One testified in a certain place, saying, 
What is man that you are mindful of him? Now, when he starts right there, what is man? And all the way down through verse 8 where he says, you put all things in subjection under his feet. All that's a quote from Psalms chapter 8. And David wrote that. And David wrote that about mankind. What is man that you're mindful of him? In fact, in the context in Psalms 8, David says, when I consider the heavens... And, and, and the moon and the stars which you have ordained, David says, I look out there and I see how vast this universe is. I see all those stars way out there, the moon way out there. And I see and I realize that I'm just a little speck of dust on a bigger speck of dust. I'm nothing. I'm nobody. And yet, you're mindful of me. What is me? I'm special. I must be special because God is mindful of me. That, what is that song we sing? Thou thinkest, Lord, of me. Thou thinkest, Lord, of me, what is man that you're mindful of him? Or the son of man that you take care of him? You've made him a little lower than the angels, a reference to humanity. You've crowned him with glory and honor. This is all about mankind. You've set him over the works of your hand. You've put all things in subjection under his feet. This is God's plan for man, but man fell short. Man became a sinner. Verse 9. Well, let's read the rest of verse 8. For in that he put all things in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not yet put under him. This was God's plan. But notice this last statement in verse 8. But we, now we do not yet see all things under him. Man hasn't achieved what God wanted for him to achieve. We fell short. We became sinners. Verse 9. But we do see Jesus, the ultimate man. The ultimate man, you see. The perfect man. The man who was everything God wanted us to be. We do see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. He became flesh just like us. For the suffering of death, that's why he became a man, to suffer death. We see him crowned with glory and honor. Here it comes, here it comes, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. The grace of God is expressed in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. That's grace. That's what grace is. And that's the biblical concept of grace. You see, we have to understand that. But it dawns on me as I think about that. What an amazing story, by the way, that God would be that mindful of us to, to send his son to come and to die on the cross. But it dawns on me as I think about that. That was 2,000 years ago, halfway around the world. What if that had happened and nobody knew anything about it? Wouldn't help me one bit, would it? If I didn't know Jesus died for me, that wouldn't help me one bit. And if you didn't know Jesus died for you, that wouldn't help you one bit. And that brings in the third component. You see, God planned it out. The Father planned it out. Jesus executed it, and the Holy Spirit communicated it. The Holy Spirit communicated it. It would do me no good if I didn't know that Jesus died for me and that there was a plan to make me right with God. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians 3, and we want to start the reading in verse 8, because I want you to see how God connected, or how Paul connected his preaching with the grace of God. I want you to see that. Verse 8, to me, that's Paul, who am less than the least of all saints. That's another hyperbole. You can't literally be less than the least. But this is a, a, an exaggerated way of expressing his humility. To me who am less than the least of all saints. I'm nothing. I'm nobody in this great scheme of things. But watch it now. To me who am less than the least of all saints. This what? This grace was given. This grace was given. What grace, Paul? That I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. The grace of God is contained in the message, isn't it? This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of what? Christ, the one who died for us. Where did he get that message? All the way back up here to verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. The Holy Spirit, the great communicator. He's the one who tells us about the plan. God conceived of the plan in his mind before time began. Christ executed the plan in the fullness of times when he came and died on the cross. The Holy Spirit provided the communication and let us know about what Jesus did. Now with that background, turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12. And here it comes again. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. There we're talking about grace once again. 
The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Everybody has access to this. Not everybody takes advantage of it, but everybody has equal access to this. It has appeared to all men. Watch the next verse. Teaching us. Did you see that? Don't let that slip by. Teaching us. What teaches us? Grace. That's just exactly what he said. Grace appears and grace teaches us. That's the Holy Spirit's work. He provided the teaching. He provided the instruction. What those apostles and prophets preached came directly from the Holy Spirit. We studied that in Bible class this morning. Came directly from the Holy Spirit, you see. And so what does he teach? He teaches us, first of all, negatively. That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts. Denying literally means to say no to. In fact, I believe that's what the NIV translation literally says there. It says, saying no to ungodliness and worldly lust. That's exactly what it means to deny, to say no to it. When you deny your children, you're saying no to them. When you deny your spouse, you're saying no to them. So denying ungodliness and worldly lust. Years ago, more years than I care to count, 40 years ago or more, Nancy Reagan, President Reagan's wife, she had this great thing that she conceived, uh, conceived of. She said, she called it the just say no to drugs. That's what it was. Just say no. And everybody lampooned her and made fun of her. They thought that was awful, but she was dead right. Just say no to it. Say no to drugs. Say no to alcohol. Say no to sinful things. Say no to ungodliness. Say no to worldly lusts. Say no to sin. You can do it. It's within your power. And God's grace teaches you that you must do that if you want to be right with God. But i got to fill that up with something. If I'm going to get rid of the sin and say no to it, then i got to fill it up with something. So he says, we should live. That's the positive side. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. Soberly means sensible. Remember when your parents used to say, act like you got some sense? That's what God's saying to us here. Act like you got some sense, Christian. Act like you know what you're doing. Live righteously, doing the right thing. And godly, godliness is reverence for God. So be respectful of God. Live soberly, live righteously, live godly. Think about that. Denying ungodliness, there's a word for that in the Bible, it's called repentance. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that's called repentance. Living soberly, righteously, and godly, that's called a new life. I'm not going to live in sin anymore, now I'm going to live for the Lord. That's called a new life. And then there's more. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Grace teaches us to look forward to that. You, you catch what he's saying there? Looking forward to it. People today say, oh, I hope the Lord don't come back today. I ain't ready. Excuse me? You better be ready. You better be looking for it. He says looking for it. Any day now. Come on, Lord. In fact, aren't there passages in the Bible that say, Come, Lord Jesus, come on. We're ready. We're ready for you. Looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. That brings us back to point two up there, right? Christ provided the sacrifice. Who gave himself for us, you see. And so think about that. That's grace. What we've just spelled out right there, that's grace. God conceived of the plan in his mind. Christ executed that plan by dying on the cross. The Holy Spirit provided the instruction. Now, in the time I have left, I want to deal with a false charge. I've heard this all my life, and I don't believe a word of it. But I hear people say, well, we never talk about grace. We never, we, in the Church of Christ, we never talk about grace. That is false to the core. I deny that with every fiber of my being. I'm going to tell you something. Every time I hit this pulpit, I talk about the grace of God. I'm going to show you why in a minute. Every time I hit this pulpit, every time Harley hits his pulpit, he's talking about the grace of God. Every time Aaron hits his pulpit, every time Wes hits his pulpit, or Keith, or Gene, they're talking about the grace of God. Let me show you what I mean. Come on. There we go. We never talk about grace. When I preach about sin, and I do a lot of that, this is wrong. This is wrong. We shouldn't do this. We shouldn't live that way. Guess what? I'm preaching about your need of grace. That's where all that's going. That's what that's all about. They say, don't lay a guilt trip on me, preacher. That's my job, to lay the guilt trip on you. I'm trying to show you that you're lost and you need grace. 
And so every time somebody preaches about sin and how terrible it is, they're talking about grace. That connects to grace because that tells me I need it. Not only that, but when I preach about Christ, I talk about his life, his miracles, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his deity. I'm talking about the means of grace. You see, without that bloody sacrifice on the cross, I can't be saved. And so when I preach anything I talk about, when I'm talking about Jesus in person and his life and miracles, I'm talking about the grace of God. He is the grace of God. He's the manifestation of the grace of God. You see what I'm saying? I deny this charge. We never talk about grace. Oh, yes, we do. Every time we hit the pulpit, we talk about grace. And don't you ever forget that. When I preach the conditions of salvation, hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. I'm telling you how to access grace. How can I get into Christ? How can I get into grace? Hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. If you've already done that, then repent and confess to God. Pray to God that perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven. When I preach conditions of salvation, I'm preaching access to grace. Don't tell me we never talk about grace. Talk about it every time we hit the pulpit. That's a fact. When I preach about faithfulness, be thou faithful unto death. And that could include a lot of things. We need to worship God acceptably. We need to live moral lives. We need to do this and we need to do that. When I preach about faithfulness, I'm preaching how to remain in grace. How can we stay in God's good grace? Don't tell me we don't talk about grace. We talk about grace every time we hit the pulpit. That's the theme of the Bible is grace. And so I hope that you understand that. And I hope that you appreciate the grace of God. This is what the Bible teaches about grace. Not that stuff we talked about this morning. That's phony baloney stuff. That's false doctrine. That's the doctrines of men. This is grace. And right now, take out your songbooks, turn to that invitation song number 317, and guess what? This is your golden opportunity to access the grace of God. We're going to sing this song, and it is, it, it, it's not something the Scripture requires, but it is our custom, and it's a great custom. I wouldn't change it for nothing, but it is our custom to extend this invitation in every service because we want you to know this is what we're all about, the salvation of souls. And so we extend the Lord's It's not our invitation, by the way. It's the Lord's invitation. He invites. Come to me, Jesus said. Come to me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. So it's the Lord's invitation. He's just using me to extend it. And this is your lucky day. The invitation is being extended to you one more time. How many times, and I can relate to this personally in my own life. Used to come with Anna when I was courting her. Used to come to services. Knew I needed to obey the gospel. Knew what I needed to do. The invitation saw him come, I grabbed the pew. I knew I needed to go forward, but I wouldn't do it. But you've got to get past that. I got past it. You've got to get past that. Turn loose of that pew. Get out in that aisle and come down here and tell us you believe Jesus Christ, the Son of God. This is your time to do it. You don't know that you'll have another chance. But this chance is here. It's here and it's now. And as the song suggests here, all things are ready. There's, there it is. It's all ready. God already has the plan laid out. Christ already died on the cross. The Holy Spirit's given us all of our instructions that we need. Everything's ready. All we need is you. If you're subject to the invitation, please, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?